Yes, that, okay, excellent. And I might want to play our theme song. I've been to Romamu, I've been to BJ, I've searched all over for a place to pray. I found the mosh pit and knew that this was it. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. Yup, and I'm turning gray. So are some of you too. I found community that is in tune with me. Singing and dancing in our Zoom agog. Everybody sing along. Some contemplation mixed with elation. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And I'm turning gray. Well, actually, my beard's turning white. A chance to meet you, a place to greet you, a time to deepen what it means to belong. Let's have some fun tonight and spread some joy and light. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And we're turning gray. Let's hear from Hoff of Shemayim. You know, Hoff's jamming up there with the best of them. Ay, ay, ay. Welcome, everybody. And I want to welcome a special guest, Dan Arbell. Dan, welcome. Thank you. Good to, good to be here. Uh, what, Dan a beautiful and I, song, what a beautiful song. Isn't that great? And Neil Young yeah. hasn't sued me yet. <laughs> yet is yeah. is, is a, I, I'm, I'm just waiting for that because that'll make us even more popular you know you can't have there's no, no such thing as bad music, publicity yeah. so uh, welcome Yael and Joe and everybody else who's joined us uh, since I said hi to everybody as uh, most of you know I have a family in Israel as well as Renee does and so Israel has been very very much on my mind and I am a keen uh, listener to the podcasts that come out of the Hartman Institute. And one in particular called For Heaven's Sake, which is hosted by Daniel Hartman and Yossi Klein Halevi, um, is where I get a lot of my Israel information from. And they have been following closely all of the events going on over the past number of months. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to break my rule which is not to talk politics here at Mosh, because this is of such importance for us to at least to be aware of the um, of the issues. And then, if possible, to um, be empowered by that knowledge to do something that uh, about about it, either the supporting um, in some way. Um, the um, <clears throat> the protests that have been going on, of course, if that's on which side that you find yourself landing on. So uh, very briefly, I want to um, into brief introduction of Dan, and then I'm going to ask you one question, Dan, and let you talk. <laughs> so here is my brief intro. Uh, Dan Arbell, who I've just met uh, today for the first time, although we had gone back and forth uh, by email is scholar in residence at the Center for Israeli Studies at AU, American University, which is right around the corner from me and Renee, and a 25-year-old veteran of the Israeli Foreign Service. Most recently, Dan was deputy chief of mission at the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C., also around the corner from us. And from 2009 to 2012, Dan worked as Ambassador Michael Oren's second in command. Um, by the way, yes, he does know Dan Shapiro and Steve Rabinowitz, for those of you who are in our inner circle here. He's a frequent guest speaker and public lecturer nationwide focusing on U.S.-Israeli relations, Israel's strategic environment and challenges, and Israel's place in the changing Middle East. Dan is married to Sarit, and together they have four children, one of whom his daughter lives in the same neighborhood as our son in Ramat Gan. Israel. So let's all give a Moshe welcome to Dan Arbel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome, Dan. So I, I, I want to start off with a question. Yeah. 
Sure. What's all the what's what are people so angry about? What is what what's <laughs> what's this all about? And uh, you know, if an hour and ten minutes from now, maybe you will have finished. <laughs> well, um, Rabbi Mark, thank you so much to you, to Renee, to everybody that's on the broadcast tonight. Um, and I want to. Rather than have a monologue and uh, just talk all the time, and I'd be happy to uh, entertain questions. And uh, you want to uh, um, interrupt me? That's fine. I don't mind. Um, and Great, again, so if, don't... Any, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand virtually or um, just gesticulate, wave at me frantically, and I'll call on you. I do want to ask that if and when you do have a question please put it in the form of a question rather than an opinion piece, if you know where my drift is, okay? If you yeah. prefer putting the question into the chat, I will see it, and uh, so you can do that as well. And when the time comes that seems appropriate to uh, ask Dan or bring the, the, uh, your question uh, to Dan's attention, I would be happy to do that. Great. So, you know, Mark, uh, you've asked me when, when Mark first approached me and said, you know, I, I want you to come on and on our broadcast and talk about the reasonableness clause. And um, I will talk about the reasonable, reasonableness clause, but but uh, one has to uh, gain a, a better, uh, you know, get the bigger picture or the broader context of this uh, <clears throat> reasonableness clause that, that is a center of controversy. And I, I want to start, and, and I really don't want to, um, you know, this is not. A, I don't think this is a cliche, and I I don't think I'm being over dramatic, but I sincerely, as, as somebody who who was born and raised in Israel, has lived there for most of his life, and has been living here in the U.S. for the last uh, t more than ten years, uh, and looking looking at, at at my home country, I do. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm deeply concerned, and I I believe that what we're witnessing today uh, is a battle for the the soul of, of, of Israel. It's, it's a battle over uh, the nature of Israeli democracy, the nature of Israel, the state of Israel, whether it will remain a democracy, a liberal democracy, or it will uh, slip slide into something uh, more uh, of a illiberal democracy, uh, the likes of Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Russia, uh, or, you know, even, you know, and, and God forbid, a dictatorship. Uh, because what's at stake here is, you know, the very nature of Israeli democracy that's being contested now between two opposing sides. The Netanyahu government came into office, sixth Netanyahu government, his sixth government, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's sixth government, came into office at the end of December 2022. And a week after it came into office, his minister of justice, Yariv Levine, presented very broad, far-reaching, uh, uh, what he called a, a uh, <clears throat> judicial reform. Um, and he had five key elements in that reform. Uh, one of them was to change the makeup and the way judges, uh, of the judges' selection committee and, and, and the way judges are selected. Uh, the other one is to um, eliminate, you know, to have uh, the parliament will adopt a what's known as an override clause, the ability for parliament to override any decision ruling by the Supreme Court. A third was <clears throat> the uh, issue of um, you know ensuring that um, legal advisors uh, in ministries of, of, of government, like legal advisor of the foreign ministry, the legal advisor of the defense ministry, that are you know, professional legal people uh, with legal backgrounds uh, and are professional appointments, not political appointments, basically then having uh, appointing a, uh, ha having uh, legal uh, advisors being appointed um, by politicians and not as growing through the system or being raised through the system and going from rank to rank to eventually become an independent uh, legal advisor or rather a political appointed legal advisor. Uh, one other element in this um, 
reform that uh, Levine uh, proclaimed was the elimination of the reasonableness clause. And honestly, nobody knew what the reasonableness clause is until six or seven months ago, until Mr. Levine you know, raised it. And what is it? It's basically the Supreme Court has um, has had as one of its tools uh, the prerogative, the ability, the authority to uh, look into uh, parliamentary legislation or into executive decisions and deem them either unconstitutional or unreasonable. Uh, over the years, Supreme Court used this authority, this tool, uh, you know, on, on, on different occasions, but I wouldn't say too many. I'd say perhaps a few dozen times over the years. But what basically the re reasonable clause, eliminating that clause meant was to take away from the Supreme Court its ability to exercise a judicial review over executive decisions. If uh, the government wants to appoint a certain the position of chief of police, somebody with a criminal record, then you know the Supreme Court can't say anything because you know here you have you know it cannot use the uh, unreasonableness uh, of such an appointment. Uh, same with you know all all sorts of decisions uh, made by the executive branch, whether decisions on, on policy or decisions on, on appointments of people, uh, of, 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 of officials to public uh, positions. And so this obviously triggered a, a strong uh, response from the opposition and from general sectors in society, whether it's lawyers or doctors or high tech people or just ordinary Israelis, that uh, since Levine presented his uh, reform plan, have uh, every week after week have been protesting uh, against this uh, suggested re reform. And so, wherever you stand on this issue, it's you. If you if you if you if you support it, those who support uh, the plan, the judicial plan of the government, they, they they're they're known to use the term judicial reform. Those who oppose it talk about a judicial overall plan. And so it's that's kind of a nuance uh, in the language, but it gives you a sense of where people stand by the way they present it. If it's a reform, then if somebody talks to you about a reform, you usually he's a supporter of, of of this plan. And if somebody talks to you about and overall, then he's usually an opponent of such a plan. And so <clears throat> this uh, these elements have been you know, introduced uh, by Minister Levine just days after Mr. Mr. Netanyahu himself, when he laid out the core issues that his government will be dealing with, did not even mention this judicial plan. He talked to he he, re, he put he prioritized four topics. One was the Iran nuclear issue, one was the high cost of living, uh, uh, one was just uh, having uh, you know you know secure different security aspects and you know dealing with the uh, with the uh, with the, um, um, the, the 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 rising cost of of. Uh, of real estate and so on and so forth, but he did not mention in his priorities for his government the issue of judicial of the judicial plan, and this kind of was sprung by the uh, minister of justice Levine, and has become since then in the last seven months or seven and a half months kind of the main uh, issue of the day, uh, a very contested issue, which its supporters see it as as necessary for to reform the judicial uh, branch, having it uh, not so strong, not too active, not too aggressive, uh, arguing that the Supreme Court over the years has accumulated great powers that exceed what the forefathers of the country meant when they spoke about the checks and balances system, when they outlined uh, 
you know, the checks and balances system, while the opponents, uh, those who oppose it, are are screaming give out and are saying that this is the end of Israeli democracy as we know it, uh, because it will alter uh, permanently the balance of power between the branches. Because Israel, Israeli democracy is very delicate, and the whole separation between branches is not similar to the one in the United States. Uh, if you are um, in the United States, you have a constitution. You have two. You have a bicameral assembly. I mean, a House and a Senate. You have the states uh, that play a role. Um, you uh, <clears throat> you know, in order to uh, amend a a, a uh, the constitution, you need you need a a, a supermajority. Israel doesn't have that. Israel doesn't have a constitution. It has a set of basic laws which govern the system, but not a constitution. Israel has only one uh, assembly, the Knesset, the 120 seats. Um, and whoever controls in Israel, whoever controls uh, parliament also controls the government. So the so there's there's clearly a, a much fuzzier line between the executive and, and um, legislative branches in Israel. So the only uh, those who oppose uh, the plan are are, are 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 screaming that this is you know in Israel you cannot weaken the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the only uh, uh, roadblock or is the only uh, uh, authority to uh, to have uh, in any way that could critique the government, can limit. Uh, its excessive powers can call on injustices or unconstitutional decisions, decisions, or legislation or, or unreasonable decisions. Um, and once you remove all that, you change the way judges are, are selected so they'd be appointed by politicians, not the way it is now that its politicians are there. But there's also represented the Israeli Bar Association. There are also uh, um, you know, also Supreme Court judges and so on. Um, you remove its their Supreme Court's ability to critique the government, to check the government, to use the tools. Uh, you take away the tools that it has to exercise judicial review. You're undermining uh, checks and balances. You're undermining. Uh, you're giving uh, those in control, those in power, uh, the government, and those who control the government and the Knesset. Uh, enormous power, uh, practically unstoppable, making uh, Israeli democracy, turning it into an illiberal democracy, where all three branches are basically um, under the same umbrella or under are controlled uh, by the same uh, <clears throat> group of people. And so this is where we're at in terms of, of, uh, of um, the what what the government has has was planning to do initially. Since then, due to the protests, uh, an, an enormous, uh, you know, uh, I'd say a bottoms up, grassroots um, protest movement that has increased in size and has grown in number week after week after week. And now we're in week 31 of the protests against the Netanyahu government that are hundreds of thousands of Israelis in 150 locations around the country gather uh, in opposition to this uh, judicial plan. Uh, there was a, an inflection point in March, at the end of March, when, uh, as you know, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, the uh, what, what kind of... Uh, 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 triggered a lot of people. Uh, what, what the 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 reform the plan triggered a lot of people who do reserve duty service um, in in the IDF, um, and a lot of reserve duty officers have you know proclaimed uh, early on that if this plan judicial plan is passed, they will not volunteer for uh, reserve duty. Or some have also announced that they will not show up for reserve duty. Uh, so much so that uh, the heads of the military uh, have become 
early in, in February and March, uh, as well as the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, were very uh, much uh, um, worried, concerned about the direction of this protest movement as if, you know, thousands of reservists won't report to duty or won't show up to duty or won't uh, come for, for, for exercises, military maneuvers or exercises, then, you know, it hurts the preparedness of the IDF. It hurts its operability, especially when it comes to the Air Force, where you have hundreds of uh, pilots who volunteer for reserve duty, who've, you know, who have you have passed the age of the, in which they need to uh, um, show up for reserve duty, and they just volunteer. And, but for the Air Force to be in a state of readiness, these volunteer pilots take, uh, you know, are an integral part of this uh, readiness. And they come once a week to exercise on their on these fighter jets or on, on base. And if you and, and they they have to be uh, at at the at, at the uh, at, at a at a point of readiness, uh, which they can only get to only if they show up week after week after week. Once you remove that, once hundreds of pilots don't show up, and hundreds have threatened. Uh, not to show up, then you are, you're basically, uh, you have a handicapped Israeli Air Force, IAF. And so this led Yoav Galan back at the end of March to um, announce that, you know, call on Mr. Netanyahu to slow down the legislation, to allow more time to reach broader consensus. Um, and this has led to the creation of a dialogue framework uh, under the auspices of the Israeli president, uh, Yitzhak Herzog, back at the end of March, between the two sides, those who are advancing the, the judicial plan and those who are opposing the judicial plan, in an effort to try and reach a compromise. You know, I'm going you know, to fast forward, because uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, the hist of, of this, and I may be repeating stuff that you already know uh, but um, and we those of you who who want me to who would want me to walk walk it back or um, then then we I'd be happy to answer any questions you know on the, on the history of it but what what I do want to say is uh, to describe where, where we are now on July 24th the Knesset uh, passed the legislation that would limit the Supreme Court's uh, ability to Use the reasonableness clause um, when it uh, when it reviews government decisions, and um, this is the only piece so far that the government has passed, that the coalition has passed. And now the Knesset is out of session until the after the Chagim uh, in October, and perhaps until the end of October, early November. And Mr. Netanyahu has said that. The time that we have between now and the end of uh, October, beginning of November, is the time that we have that the parties can, the two sides can try and reach broad understandings. But the level of trust is simply, uh, you know, very low, if any. Uh, the opposition and the protest movement do not believe a word that Netanyahu is saying. Netanyahu uh, seems to be trying to uh, walk a fine line between the extremists in his camp and and uh, the more moderate uh, uh, forces in in his camp, yet uh, the, the you know there are different there are two schools of thought. One one school of thought is saying that Netanyahu is being dragged uh, to the extreme side by by, by extremists in this camp. Uh, so you hear a lot the word dragged, and you also um, the other school of thought argues that it's all Netanyahu that Netanyahu is hand rocks the cradle and then it's all Netanyahu is doing and he's just letting others do the you know the dirty work for him but he uh he has full support uh for 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 this uh, judicial plan to move forward and in the meantime the Israeli economy is tanking uh investment foreign investments in the high-tech sector are, are down the shekel uh, is you know at an 
is now traded at uh, the dollar is traded at 3.72 uh, shekels. Uh, there is, uh, you know, businesses are feeling are are beginning to feel uh, the heat. It's an early stage, but the economic indicators are negative, and uh, it only promises to get worse if this uh, judicial panel will move forward. On the security side, you see what, what I've talked about, the IDF preparedness, operability, cohesion, these are, they're all at risk. And then also the Western world or Western democracies are looking in awe and, and pretty much uh, are bewildered by what's going on in Israel. Um, and uh, especially the United States and the Biden administration, which have basically you know, called on Mr. Netanyahu to slow down, uh, the judicial plan to have a broader reach decisions by broader consensus, to rush, um, you know, not to allow um, Israeli democracy to, you know, slip further. Uh, you know, so much so, I mean, when do you remember State Department or the White House issuing uh, press statements, uh, calling on the Israeli government to allow the freedom of assembly of protesters in Israel. I mean, this is, these are, this is wording. These are sentences that the State Department and the White House reserve for, uh, for, for authoritarian regimes, like uh, whether it's Russia or Turkey or, or you know, African dictatorships, uh, not for Israeli democracy. And this is something pretty, pretty much um, unprecedented. And there is a lot of pressure from the Biden administration on the government, the Israeli government, to, you know, reach a consensus, um, uh, try and reach agreements, not to move too swiftly, uh, and so on and so forth. So, on one hand, you have the, the and now let me the Netanyahu side, is that you know he believes that you know these issues, or at least his constituency, his constituencies who supported his, um, the, you know, this coalition uh, are made up of basically three parts, the, the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox, who want this judicial plan uh, to move forward because they want uh, full exemption for young yeshiva bachers from the IDF. And so that, that kind of um, um, takes care of that from their, that point of view. I mean, if there's an override clause passed by the Knesset, which will override Supreme Court decisions. The Supreme Court has ruled over the years that idea that some of the ultra-Orthodox young young men do need to serve or there some some sort of process for them to get out of service, but there's not full exemption. But the Haredi want full exemption. Then you have the ultra-nationalist or, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, that... Um, the far right, which wants this uh, plan to move forward because they want uh, to legalize illegal outposts, to legalize settlements in the occupied in the West Bank, to um, you know create facts on the ground that would uh, move the you know uh, which which would make uh, the possible you know the two state solution even 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 uh, more impossible. Finally, you have the Netanyahu camp, which is, um, and spe specifically Mr. Netanyahu, he, he wants his, uh, he wants to have a, a great, a stronger grip uh, and and more a tighter control over the legal process, and especially as he's standing for criminal trial, his main his main uh, goal here is to get out of his trial, or at least either bring his trial to an end somewhat in some way, or or uh, slow down uh, the or just cancel this whole uh, trial altogether. And so you have a convergence of interests of all these three parts of the coalition, who, by the way, I'll give them, I would say that they all, for different reasons, they do believe that the Israeli Supreme Court is too strong, has too great of an authority, is too active, and therefore they want to limit that. So here we are. Uh, the reasonableness clause has passed. And it's challenged now in the Supreme Court. There are several appeals, and they will all be uh, considered by the, by the Supreme Court itself on September 12th. For the first time in Israeli history, 
all 15 judge justices of the Supreme Court will be deliberating over this particular, uh, these appeals. There's never been uh, any appeal in the history of the Supreme Court, which all 15 justices sat on it. There have been different, there's groups of 11, of nine, of three, but never 15. And this kind of indicates the, the seriousness of the matter at hand. And the fact that, you know, the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, Esther Chayut, she wants to make sure that, you know, this decision, whatever decision is reached, you know, it would have that all justices on the Supreme Court have, have given their thoughts to it, have their opinions, and, and are part of it. That no one will be omitted from this process. But on September 12th, uh, this would come to the Supreme Court. It won't, it won't be decided that day. It will take a few days, if not weeks, for the Supreme Court to uh, deliberate over the appeals against the, the legislation on the uh, eliminating the reasonableness clause. But at the end, the Supreme Court will reach a decision. Now, already we see uh, there are two possibilities here. One possibility is that the Supreme Court will reach a decision, will rule that the legislation is eliminating the unreasonable legislation uh, clause is unreasonable and therefore uh, or unconstitutional and therefore they will uh, nullify the legislation or reject the legislation. Uh, another option is that they'll pass it, that they'll let it go that they'll you know rule that it's uh, that it's fine and you know that they won't inter they won't rule that it's fine, but they will say that we are not intervening in this decision. There is a third uh, option, and the third option is a a um, that the Supreme Court will ask the coalition, the, the Knesset, to mo make modifications in the legislation, and that that perhaps to postpone it by a few years, perhaps to insert uh, different language, and so on and so forth. So these are the three options, but. What we're talking the nuclear option that everybody's talking about is that the Supreme Court will decide to um, nullify this legislation. And this uh, puts Israeli democracy in uncharted territory. Because what happens next? If the Supreme if the Parliament passed this law, which is backed by Parliament, backed by government, and opposed by the Supreme Court, Supreme Court is this, the, the law of the land is you know who who um, who has who has the greater authority here? The Supreme Court, by its ruling, um, uh, you know, is that the final word, or will the government Parliament refuse to abide by the decision by the ruling of the Supreme Court? And we already see. Uh, representatives of the government, of the coalition, issuing threats against the Supreme Court, stating that the Supreme Court has no place to intervene in basic laws. And we'll talk about, and I'd be happy to address what basic laws is in, in the Q&A. Um, and so what will happen then? If the court rules one thing, and the government and parliament uh, are... Um, unwilling to abide by the ruling of the court, where does it put Israeli democracy? Who would the gatekeepers be listening to? Who would the IDF chief of staff be listening to? The Supreme Court's ruling? Or the government that's refusing to, um, to abide by the ruling? What about the head of Mossad? What about the head of the Shin Bet? What about the chief of Israeli police? What would they do? And so all these... Uh, Elements are in play right now. It's hard to say right now where this, where uh, how the chips will fall. Uh, but it's a very scary scenario in which, uh, as I said, it's uncharted territory, and we may be seeing a, you know, once the Supreme Court makes, if the Supreme Court rules, and there's a high likelihood that it would rule, that you know this legislation is unreasonable or unconstitutional or you know needs modifications or there's a good chance of that, and that. Then, what would Mr. Antonio do? Would he respect the ruling of the Supreme Court? 
And if he doesn't, or if his government doesn't, then we're in a constitutional chaos, uh, a very chaotic situation in which um, hard to see how, how we come out of it uh, in, in, in one piece. And God forbid, you know, there are different scenarios that people are entertaining or talking about, like the civil war or, uh, you know, a, a, a serious clash between uh, those who oppose the plan and those who support the plan. And again, this is just over one piece of it, because Mr. Netanyahu has indicated in his last interview to the Bloomberg News, uh, just this uh, in the recent days, that once um, Knesset is back from, from its uh, break, then he would be moving on to the next step to change the makeup of the Judges Selection Committee, which is also something, a very uh, delicate topic, very uh, complicated issue, and uh, uh, which is very controversial. So, you know, I you know I don't didn't want to depress you on a Sunday night, uh, but uh, this is uh, the way I see it right now. And um, I'd stop here and be happy to um, answer any questions you may have or any comments that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have a number of questions that people put into the chat. Um, I do want to share with you and everyone that um, I, it's all, it is very sad and as well as being very concerning. I've heard it referred to that, you know, that we're basically it's an existential crisis over Israeli democracy. Um, and my son, uh, our son said to me in the car when we were driving, uh, we were in Israel over Hanukkah, this is before all of this hit the fan, um, that unless you had a very specific reason to be in Israel right now, um, the, the, why would anybody want to move here with what he saw on the horizon? And, and he just left and he reiterated, reiterated the same thing about the deterioration of so many different things. Um, that uh, is, is Israel, including you would, that you alluded to at the beginning, the high cost of real estate. I mean, they've been looking for a place to buy for like three years um, and have been able to do so. Um, you, you use the term constitutional crisis, um, but how can there be a constitutional crisis if there's no constitution? <laughs> Again, I'm not and, a legal expert, but I would say this. Uh, you know, when Israel was created, um, the the you know David Ben Gurion and uh, the leaders of uh, the newly established state um, had every intention of uh, advancing the drafting of constitution. So much so that a constitutional committee has been, was set up in order to draft the constitution. Um, but then, some of you may, may be aware of the fact that uh, there was controversy over that, uh, especially from the, those uh, sectors, the religious sectors, Jewish religious sectors, who are arguing that um, there should not be a constitution because there cannot be any document which supersedes the Torah, the mm -hmm. Holy Scriptures. And so Ben-Gurion's compromise at the time with the religious parties was that a constitutional committee would be set up but um, as you know as as the state was already you know born and operating then you need a set of laws to govern this state uh, and if you don't have a constitution you know instead of a constitution you would what you have is uh, you would basically adopt or pass in the Knesset a set of basic laws and these basic laws uh, would basically set stage for you know, how Israeli democracy operates and would basically govern the Israeli system. So basic laws were adopted, basic law Knesset, basic law government, basic law supreme the legal system, basic law the Israeli economy, basic law the IDF, and so on and so forth. Uh, today they're almost in total, there are almost 20 basic laws. Uh, but these basic laws, the I, back in the day when, when the, there was a constitutional assembly, but there was agreement that to postpone the drafting of constitution to a later date, the idea was that at a certain point there would be a constitution. 
And the basic laws that have been passed throughout the years would basically make up the future constitution. And the Israeli Declaration of Independence would basically be the preamble to such a constitution. So the fact that there's no constitution does not mean that uh, there's no constitutional aspects to, uh, to the Israeli system. You have the set of basic laws, which are basically uh, in nature, they are they govern the system the same way a constitution does. And they set the stage and they establish the framework for Israeli democracy. Uh, the problem with basic laws has become that there's no supermajority needed to pass basic laws. And today, you can decide, let's say tomorrow morning, a group of Knesset members wants to uh, pass a basic law to uh, bring down the price of, uh, of water. And uh, a simple majority is enough to pass a basic law that, uh, you know, a two to one majority. Let's say there are three members of Knesset out of, the, out of the 120 members in session. It's enough that you have two to one to pass a, a, and call it a basic law. So basic law has been, in the early days, has these were major laws, very comprehensive, very detailed, that, that were, were aimed to govern the system. But today, there's been a, a, a kind of a a cheapening of what a basic law is all about. So if the government now has, uh, has passed a, an amendment to one of the laws uh, allowing, uh, to one of the basic laws allowing um, this um, elimination of reasonableness clause, then you basically are, um, you know, you, you um, uh, by the mere fact that it's called the basic law, they argue that the Supreme Court cannot uh, interpret basic laws or cannot uh, rule over basic laws. But this is something that uh, those who oppose it are saying, of and Supreme Court justices themselves are saying, of course we can, you know, there's no place in the Israeli legal code that says the Supreme Court cannot interpret or deliberate over or rule over uh, basic laws. So um, uh, this is where we're at. Uh, the government is arguing uh, they cannot interpret basic laws. The Supreme Court itself keeps, you know, holds a pro upholds its prerogative to interpret and rule over basic laws. And this is uh, there's a deep divide there uh, about this. But uh, this is to answer uh, your question about. Uh, I'm sorry, I kind of slipped into uh, talking about basic laws. But uh, this is kind of uh, an answer to what you said. Without a con how can it be unconstitutional without a constitution? Yeah, no, thank you, Dan. Um, I hope it's clear. Yeah, I, it is for me. Um, and I, I hope it is for everybody else, too. If it's not, watch the video again when, when I post the link. Um, so you, you painted for us a, uh, a, a very a real um, uh, slippery slope of if, if this has already has been passed or it's but if the Supreme Court in September, when they reconvene, um, it decides just to let it go that there are a number of things that are then are going to um, be followed up uh, by this um, government, which has a very, the slimmest of majorities, correct? So, not the slimmest, uh, but, not the slimmest but they have a 64 out of 120. Yeah. The previous so, government had a 61, a 60 at times, but, but it is not, it's not a huge majority. It's, it's not, right. Yeah. Um, uh, and we, we need to admit that it was democratically elected. And Correct. so the question of what doesn't a democratically elected government have the right to make whatever laws it wants to make since it's speaking for the people. But where I wanted to go here is um, one thing that to um, include in the slippery slope, if you can speak about the danger to minority rights. Yes, absolutely. So there are many issues to cover here, but uh, so obviously um, you're right in saying that and no one is arguing against it, the fact that, you know, the coalition has a majority, it's a pretty solid majority of 64 members. It's not a huge majority, but it's, it's a, still a majority. And a majority um, can can pass legislation. And it's legal that they pass legislation. But, you know, uh, but Israel's Declaration of Independence has... Uh, issued in, on, on May 14th, uh, 
1948, uh, you know, talks about equality as as a key principle in Israeli society in the in the, the in Israeli society, <clears throat> and also talks about uh, basic rights that everybody would enjoy, uh, including minorities. Um, so while there's a while a majority in the parliament can pass laws, um, the system is not. You're not the system. Um, there cannot be a tyr tyranny of the majority. Um, the right, uh, while, you know, majority can, uh, you know, a government based on a majority can devise policy, implement policy, can pass legislation, but not trample over minority rights. Whether it's the Arab minority, whether it's uh, religious people, where, whether it's <clears throat> no one's arguing about the fact that the government can um, pass laws. But what the government, but again, this is my personal view, and I'm uh, what I see that the government is doing is that it is it's not just making. Netanyahu called it a small minor change. This is not a small minor change. What Netanyahu's coalition is trying to do is change the entire system. In order to change the entire system, you either need a referendum, you know, bring out your plan, have a vote on it, the entire country votes. Um, or if not, then you at least have to have a supermajority, two thirds of the members three quarters of the members, you know that uh, in order to make, there's Naftali Bennett, before he became prime minister, uh, when he was leader of Yamina party in the coalition, he passed the law that any future territorial compromises made by any Israeli government would require a approval of at least 80 members of Knesset, 80 out of 120, simple math, <clears throat> that's 75%, I think, is it? Two-thirds. No, two-thirds, sorry, two-thirds. So yeah, um, 66%. So, so yeah, so if you want to, if you want to, no, you know, voters gave them, Israeli voters gave the coalition the votes to, to lead, to rule, but they did not give them the mandate to entirely change the system, to change it to, to, to overall the system. So, um, this is basically what we're facing right now. So, you know, uh, while the majority has has a say, an important say, and you know, uh, nobody's doubting that they, you know, that they're the majority, and they're they've been the democratically elected, they cannot trample over the minorities. And what by the Supreme Court, you actually you weaken the main shield that is defending minorities in Israel today. You're muted, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> I Oftentimes I want to have a coffee cup. We're going to have, that's the next retreat. We'll give everybody coffee cups. On one side it'll say mute yourself, on the other side it'll say unmute yourself. Um, David Rochelle, would you unmute yourself please for a moment? because I didn't quite yes. understand the question that you were asking, and um, but it seems Sorry. like a good time to ask it. <laughs> okay, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, 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 I'm always, I, was I was actually in Israel during the election, so it was kind of fascinating. But um, yeah. the, the people who right now are who have been elected, who don't support Netanyahu, why don't they hold their nose and say, all right, we'll work with you, but you need to stop working with these far right crazy people um, for the betterment of the company, for the betterment of the country? Well, uh, it's a great question, Dave. And um, over, over, over the last, uh, you know, we all know, you, you all know that Israel has gone through five election cycles and just over a period of 
just over three and a half years. And uh, those election cycles were centered over one key issue. Uh, it was the pro-Netanyahu, pro-Bibi Netanyahu camp versus the anything but Bibi camp. Um, and uh, at a certain point after the third election cycle, you may recall that um, you know, both Likud, Netanyahu's party, and Blue and White, which was Benny Gantz's party, received pretty much uh, the same number of seats. Um, and in a very controversial decision uh, by Benny Gantz, the leader of Blue and White, he joined the main, you know, the main, Benny Gantz was Netanyahu's main challenger, and he joined the Netanyahu government, losing half of his party uh, in this process. But he sided with Netanyahu, agreed to support him, and um, and they worked together for a year until uh, Netanyahu uh, went back on on a promise that he made to uh, Gantz, and the government fell apart. And after a year, the country went to a fourth election cycle. So there's a deep, deep distrust uh, problem between. Uh, the parties that are today making up the Israeli opposition, either Benny Gantz, Yair Lapid, Avigdor Lieberman, and others, uh, and Mr. Netanyahu. They just don't believe a word he's saying. That's one thing. Second is the fact that Netanyahu is standing. Why didn't they want to sit with him in a government? They did not want to sit in the government with him because he's standing for trial. For He's, he's, in, he's in the midst of his criminal trial, facing three uh, serious charges, uh, bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. The bribery uh, uh, charge seems to be a bit wobbly nowadays, but, um, you know, after some uh, some court deliberations, but still, he is facing fraud and breach of trust. Both, both uh, counts, on both counts, by the way, Mr. Ehud Olmert, who was prime minister between 2006 and 2009, who, uh, who, who's in, you know, who who was charged with receiving money illegally uh, in much lesser amounts than Netanyahu was charged with, and he sat in jail for 19 months. So clearly, if Netanyahu was found guilty, he could um, face a, a serious jail sentence. And so um, there are voices in Israel arguing that, you know, the opposition should the opposition not against Yair Lapid should just brush aside all the disagreements that they have with Mr. Now, all the distrust that they have with him, and just um, join him in a emergency coalition, just like the one that existed, just like Menachem Begin did on the eve of the 1967 war when he joined the Levi Eshkol led government uh, before the war. And just uh, support Netanyahu, and by that way, let Netanyahu get rid of those extremists in his in his coalition. But it's not clear whether Netanyahu is. First of all, it's, they are not willing to do so, and it's not clear whether Netanyahu is willing to give up his alliance with these forces, because at the end of the day, they, on many of the issues, including Mr. Netanyahu's own criminal trial and indictments, they support him. And they want the trial to be to end, and they want the Supreme Court much weakened, and um, and these are all um, issues that Netanyahu uh, believes in or supports or or at least wants them to have. They they, they serve his interests, two primary interests. One is to remain prime minister as much as possible, as long as possible. Second is to get out of the trial. So. You know, in a, in a in a in a Pollyannish world, it's a it's a it's something that uh, that could could uh, you know it's something to hope for. But you know, realistically speaking, I just don't see the opposition parties giving up um, or, or trust all of a sudden trusting Mr. Netanyahu, and I don't see necessarily Mr. Netanyahu giving up or turning his back to his current allies. So I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Dan, give us your um, personal take on, uh, you know, you said you didn't want to leave us with a downer on this night. Um, so give us some hope. The 
the, the movement that this has given rise to. Do you have any feel for um, what it might lead to, whether there's a political movement afoot that is different than in the past? Are there new leaders that are emerging um, that might uh, take, a, uh, take a place um, in, in future, what Israel looks like in the future? Um, what all these would be the equivalent of several million people here marching in different cities uh, every Saturday night. Uh, it's just unbelievable. So what what's your sense th it, uh, the ground the groundswell and what it might turn into and how it might be used going forward uh, once all of this is I don't even know what behind us means at this point. Um, yeah, well, I, I think that uh, the protest movement, you know, one 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 ray of hope that that uh, mark that you are referring to is, is the fact that uh, you know many many Israelis for years have been sitting on the fence, uh, have been feeling very comfortable with their living in their bubble, uh, you know, going to work, you know, uh, doing the things that they like, not bothered by by politics, going abroad several times a year, taking a vacation here, vacation there. Doing their hobbies and, and and not not you know minding their own business and then just not 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 interfere not actively we're not act actively involved in, in in politics and I think that what what has happened since December is that a huge number of Israelis who sat on the fence are are off the fence now and are in the streets. It's for the first time in in since you know, since they were born. They feel that uh, their way of life is being threatened. That everything that they, you know, believed in, stood for, uh, you know, that, that everything may, may is could possibly, uh, you know, change in a, in a very dramatic way and affect their lives in a very, very strong way. And so, that's something that um, so people are are. Definitely not indifferent. You're you're either on this side or the other side, but you're somewhere. A lot of people that were not involved in the past are, are out there, and and people who who are who again who were. And so that's one thing. The protest movement is is very. Did he just freeze? Yes, he froze. Uh, he did come back on last time after uh, yeah. 30 seconds. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, I'm sorry? Dan, you froze for about uh, th at least oh. 30 seconds. So wind your tape back, if you would. No, so uh, I'm sorry about that. So, um, I, um, so, so what happened is that what I think is, is, is amazing to see is the protest movement of ordinary people, the grassroots level, Go, you know, having the, you know, all of a sudden, all these people, you know, I was in Israel. Maybe you were there too, and you saw it. I was there in June, uh, visiting my daughter, and I went to a friend's house and to my brother's house, and everybody has a flag in their in their in their room, and the flag is there, ready to grab to go out to protest uh, in the street. So there, you know, thousands of people are with flags taking to the streets, and so. Uh, Young kids after the army who usually were not involved in the political process or did not care about politics are all of a sudden a major part of this protest movement. And again, people who are indifferent or just uh, passive are now very active. And you have different, uh, and there is no leader, there is no politician, which is, there are politicians that are taking parts in part of the protests or in part of the demonstrations or part of the rallies. They are. But most of the leaders of this movement are ordinary Israelis. There are people. There are scientists. There, uh, very. Some of you may have read the New York Times profile of uh, Professor Shikma Bressler, a very impressive physicist from the Weizmann Institute, who happens a 42-year-old mother of five, who's one of the key leaders of this protest movement, who just got fed up with what's happening and took to the streets and became a leader. And there are others like her, who are. Um, it's not a very hierarchical uh, uh, leadership, and they're not, at least they're making a, a point to say that they're not planning to 
turn their group of leaders into a political party in the future. But certainly, I think that any election that will take place in the future, right now, elections are not scheduled for 2026. Maybe if, you know, if the majority loses, if the coalition loses its majority, we may see earlier elections. But any election that will take place in the future will clearly, whether it's in two years, three years, uh, will definitely include elements that we now are seeing uh, in the, as part of the protests. And that may alter the balance between the uh, pro-Netanyahu bloc and, and anything but Netanyahu bloc. Thank you, Dan. Um, in the few minutes that we have left, um, I don't want to ignore those of you who put other questions in the chat, um, but I'm wondering if any of you have any questions that you'd like to unmute yourself with, um, if, if they could be the same questions, if they're still relevant, um, or they could be other questions for where we are in the conversation right now. Um, anyone have anything you'd like to ask? Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, in, in my Facebook page, I put uh, uh, the other day that uh, my heart was broken and the government of Israel broke my heart. I am Israeli. I lived here for 15 some years. And, um, and what is happening there is going to ruin the country because the people, I think that the people that can contribute so much to it will not do it, will go away, will fly away, will go to to other country or not be able to not want to do it and will end up with a bunch of people that do not, never served in the army, never served Israel at all, sat in rooms and, and, and prayed and whatever. And this is very, very scary. I have a, 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 nep a great nephew that is a pilot in the Air Force and he left, he quit the Air Force, he could do it. And he left the Air Force and he became, he got um, a citizenship of Portugal because in my family, my, my parents and my, grand my great grandparents were from there. So he got, he and his, and his brother and sister got Portugal passport. And this is a family that every every one of them served in the in the in the armed forces as as uh, you know in the air force and all yeah, that. Yeah. It's very scary. What's scary is that it's going to be the, the 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 done with Israel. That's what I'm afraid of. So yeah, so, so, yeah. Go ahead, Dan. I was going to say thank you, Rachel, for a personal snapshot um, yeah. of uh, that brings home to us in a very direct manner. Do you have a question for Dan or uh, besides? No, uh, I, just, I just I just sat here and when he talked, it just broke my heart. More. Yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. very sad, too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You can hear it from his voice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank but you. I think that, I think that, uh, you know, there's a, you know, Talks of brain drain, talks of uh, many young Israelis leaving, seeking citizenship in Portugal or Greece or relocating to Australia or to the United States or Canada. Then you hear that a lot uh, nowadays. It's, it's very common uh, uh, that, that, that you hear that because people are kind of, uh, and, and again, if that happens in, 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 you know, in great numbers and obviously it's uh, it's something that's very bothering and something that, that that's uh, uh, um, not definitely bad news uh, in the bad news uh, column for sure. Yeah. Linda and then Dan, if you could Good both evening. keep it concise, please. I will. Um, I don't know what news reports to believe. Do you think that the American media? is accurately portraying the situation? First of all, I'd suggest that, uh, that you uh, um, uh, read uh, English uh, language uh, web uh, news websites from Israel. I'd say the Times of Israel is, um, can be, and I'm talking about free. There, there's Haaretz, which is, uh, there's a firewall you have to pay. But you have uh, Ynet, you have uh, Times of Israel, uh, you have Jerusalem Post, which is okay. 
um, and you can get some some of your uh, uh, accurate news uh, from there. Although again, every every news nowadays, every news outlet is a bit uh, is not uh, necessarily super objective. Or each one has kind of a, a filter. Um, in terms of the U.S. media, I think that um, you know, I'd say that the New York Times and Washington Post are portraying what's going on in Israel pretty accurately. I'd say that the Wall Street Journal is pretty much has adopted the uh, line of the Netanyahu government and is rather kind of uh, very much uh, kind of supported this plan and is very much being fed by uh, Netanyahu, Ron Dermer, and others. Um, so again, it depends what you want to. But I'd say that uh, you know, it's. I don't. I think I, I would have expected uh, this to to get more noticed. I don't know. Maybe it's the summer months. Maybe kind of uh, the U.S. politics is is kind of uh, um, at the you know are, are more obviously uh, get more attention and what's going on with Trump and everything and Biden and all that is is is, is more important. But I, I would have expected more coverage. I don't. There is coverage, but not not huge. And um, but I would say that the Washington Post and New York Times are are uh, portraying the situation, reporting about it pretty accurately. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah, Dan, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm I'm sorry. I was unmuted. I was muted. Let me just uh, follow up on Linda's um, that. I want to put my two shekels in for listening to the podcasts out of Hartman uh, called the uh, For Heaven's Sake. Um, and if you look at the titles of the podcast, you're going to see one recently called the Reasonableness Clause, and then after the passage of it um, two weeks ago, the Unreasonableness Law. Um, and before that, there were a number of podcasts on the different players that was all leading up to this that, of course, began uh, oh so many months ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think that's a, a really good place to get some information. And uh, those guys love each other. They're very funny, too. So it's it's it, it's um, it's a good source for me anyway of information. Dan, bring this home, please. And then um, there's a, a way I want to wrap us up tonight. Yeah, of course, I have 27 questions, but I'll just stick with one, uh, which is, is there, several people mentioned it in the chat, is there any legal way to force either a recall of the current government or a new election or a vote of no confidence or, or would it require peeling off um, a party or two in the coalition so that it drops to under 64. Um, yeah. So, so right. So, so the current balance 64 are uh, in the coalition, 56 in the opposition. And in order for, uh, you know, no confidence vote would have to have, uh, you, you'd need a majority. Uh, so you'd need at least four members of the current coalition to switch sides. Um, or, uh, or 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 leave the coalition or or abstain, um, but no, but even but if they abstain, it's not enough. It will be then sixty versus fifty six. They need to switch sides. Uh, so the coalition can can collapse if uh, one of the parties is unhappy or decides that, or certain members of the Likud party are decide to break away. In their party, uh, in pro, you know, out of disagreement uh, over policy, um, it can happen. But right now, it looks for for the very near future, at least till the end of this year, it looks like a long shot. Uh, but it, it it may happen in the future. There's no no telling right now. It's 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 hard to project, but uh, it could happen. Thank you. To the two Dan's for the question and to the answer. Uh, Dan Arbell, thank you so, so much for um, joining us uh, this evening. If you would stay on after everybody leaves so you and I can uh, chat just for another a second or two. Um, speaking of, uh, for heaven's sake, um, in the last uh, episode of it, uh, in the conversation between Danielle Hartman and Yossi Klein Alivi, they share that they went to the Knesset on the day of the vote. But they got there late. But when we got there, they found that uh, <laughs> that it was like Tisha B'Av, that people were in mourning. And then they, the most rem remarkable thing happened. 
with, the, with them with uh, Israeli flags in hand and everybody else was, that the, the speeches were so powerful. The speeches were so hopeful that it turned ashes into hope. That people came away from, even though it had passed, uh, with a sense that something better is around the corner, that, they've, that something has been built here. Um, and then the entire day ended with Hatikva. So two things. Number one is, uh, since this too is Torah, that we have um, immersed ourselves in this evening, is there anyone who needs to say Kaddish? Renee, and I suspect there's some others as well. So if you're able to stand as well as unmute yourself at this time, Renee, I'll know you're ready when you unmute. I unmuted you if that's what you were trying to do. No, I'm opening the seat. Let the silence serve for us uh, prayers that are um, intended to the heart of those who have been finding themselves hating each other, their brothers, their sisters. You know, we are, we are given the instruction not to hate your brother in your heart and that it was for senseless hatred that the mm -hmm. temple was destroyed. And this is a moment that that is of great, great concern as well. And so we look to the heavens, but we mostly look into each other's hearts to find hope and to find a way out of this that is sensible, that will bring us together. Kaddish Yatom. Yit Gadal, V'yit Gadash, Shemei Rabbah. Amen. Bilma Divra, Kivutei, V'yamlich Malchutei. Bachayechon, Uvimechon, Uvachayedachol Beit Yisrael. Bagala Uvizman Kari Vimru Amen. Amen. Yehe Shme Rabba Mivarach Leolam Alame Almaya. Yit Barach, Yishtaba, Yit Paar, Yit Romam Viet Nase. Yet Adar Viet Ale, Viet Alal, Shme de Kudisha, Brichu. Brichu. Leilam in Kol Birchata, Vishirata. Tush Bachata, Venechamata. The Amiran be Alma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba min Shamaya, Vachayim, Aleinu, Vial Kol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. Amen. Se Shalom, Vimrama, Fu, Ya Se Shalom, Aleinu, Vial Kol Yisrael, Vial Kol Yosvei Tevel, Vimru, Amen. Amen. As long as within our hearts the Jewish soul sings, as long as forward to the east to Zion looks the eye, our hope is not yet lost. It is 2,000 years old to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. <laughs> Ulafate Mizrach Kadima Ayn Tzion Tzofia Hod lo avda tikvateinu Ha-tikva bachnot al pahayim Liyotam chofshi Hey, heart, say no, Eretzion, Virushalayim, Liot am Hofshi, Hey, heart, say no, Eretzion, Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. 
Dan, uh, we are so, so grateful uh, for uh, uh, sharing your Torah and your knowledge with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for listening. Laila Tov, everyone. Laila Tov, thank you. Goodbye, yeah, Mark. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Can I show, can I show you something, please? This is my, this is the great nephew, the pilot that quit. Oh, wow. And he was the number one in his course. And his father did not live to see him. See? Yeah. yeah. And his dad did not live to see him graduating. So he gave this whole, uh, he calls it a knafaim shel abba. The, mm -hmm. the wings for, for my father, of my father. Oh, beautiful. This is the guy that left. Yeah. So you can wow. imagine what's going on. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. All righty, Judy, Dan, Rav Sarah, Helka, Laila Tov, Diane, thanks for joining yeah. us. Laila Tov. Laila. Laila Tov. Bye, thanks. I'm slowly removing people because a lot of people can't figure out how to do it themselves. And there we go. Ah, one more. Okie doke. Dan, thank you. Oh, hold on, let me stop the um, 